Okay. So for this chapter, we'll talk about data imports and for the learning objectives include um, reading data from disk. We'll use the read function, read, sorry, the read R package and using the read functions and family of functions. Uh, we'll compare and contrast the read underscore, okay, so a bunch of read functions with the base R equivalent. And we'll also pass character data in other types using the read R function, which is the different functions of pass, the pass function. And um, in that, we list the complication that arise when passing numeric strings. Uh, we'll understand how various character encodings can make it tricky to pass characters. Um, we'll also diagnose the problems that arise when we use the read R functions and we'll write data into disk using the right function, which is a family of functions as well. So let me start. To read the, the plain text rectangular files into R, we will learn, the, we will learn uh, principles which will be applied into other forms of data. So we'll first load the tidyverse package to get the read R package, which is part of the core tidyverse, um, the tidyverse package. So I saw this, this function package, so, so you suppress the package startup messages. And I, I just have a question if there's any harm in loading tidyverse as such. What I understand is with this, it doesn't print out the package and their function and their versions, sorry. Um, so yeah, it's you know, uh, the only reason not to do that is uh, to like getting the con conflict messages can be helpful if something goes wrong. Um, but other than that, uh, yeah, you don't need to get that notice every time. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So these are the different functions that we'll use. The read CSV will read the comma delimited files. There is the read CSV2 underscore, sorry, read underscore CSV2. Um, it reads semicolon separated files. And this is common in countries where we have comma is used in place of the decimal place. And uh, there's the read underscore TSV file, which reads the, the um, tab delimited files. And finally, the, the read underscore the limb, which reads in files with any delimiter. There's another function that is read underscore FWF, which reads files with fixed width. And um, in, this in this function, we have got um, to specify the widths with, we have to specify the width, and also we have to specify the positions with this function the FWF <laughs> position. So there's also another function of read underscore table, which reads common variation of fixed width with files where columns are separated by a white space. We have another function called the read underscore log. This reads uh, the Apache, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, style log files. And as suggested, we are we are to check out the web R, sorry, web reader R, which is built on the read underscore log, and it provides helpful tools. But in this chapter, we'll focus only on read underscore the CSV file. Lucy, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, I didn't quite get the read uh, underscore FWF. So what is fixed with? mean and can you give an example maybe as to why you would have a file that is fixed with and what positions you need to specify? Okay, so I'll, I'll, under, I'll explain, I'll answer parts of your question. Thank from you. what I understood from chapter uh -huh. 10 is width is about columns. So that is what I understood, okay. but width is the same as columns because um, there's part of the exercise where we are asked, how do we want to specify the number of columns using in this function, the read 
underscore FWF. So I threw something in the chat to kind of show it, although I think I might have missed a space now that I'm looking at it. Um, mm -hmm. The idea is where you, it's, it's like you're visually making something that makes sense in the text file where you line all the characters up. That's what makes it fixed width. So it would be like column one is three characters, or I guess in my case, it's uh, five characters wide or six characters wide. And there's always the first six characters are column one. Four. And then the next, uh, how you know, whatever, however many I break it up as. So I am counting the spaces as part of the character. So this space space is yeah. column one, that space 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 is column two. And then, you know, another space is the column three. And you would tell it, this is my breakdown that it's my first column is five or six spaces wide, six characters wide. Second column is eight characters wide, seven characters wide, whatever. And so that's where you're telling it exactly. And so if, you know, like if you tried to run that and you had, uh, had something like that and you say, okay, my first column is, uh, you know, eight characters wide, then it would be that. So that would be what it puts into the first column because it's just taking the first eight characters and saying that's column one, whatever is there. Um, I don't like, I almost never, I can't, I can't think of a time, any time in recent history that I've worked with a fixed width file. Right. Yeah. I was just wondering why, what kind of yeah. data would show up that way or why would you want it that way? I think most likely case would be if someone made a text file to be human readable and then you were trying to read that in so they spaced it out to be pretty when you're looking at it okay. and then when you try to read that in but then often the way they're spacing it out would have spaces or you know you could use something else as your delimiter um mm -hmm. but if they you know if it has all those extra spaces that can be a pain to deal with but if it's fixed with it'll like it'll deal with it um, Got it. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Okay. Thank you, John. <laughs> You're welcome. So these are not here. That um, not only are CSV most common forms of data storage, but once we understand how to use the read underscore CSV, we can easily apply the learned knowledge to all other functions stated above. So the first argument in this function is the path, which is the path to the file to read. So I, I downloaded the Penguin CSV file and I read it, and this is the path where it is. So the read CSV prints out a column specific that gives the name and the type of column, as we see above here. So it gives um, the columns and the type See, this is the, the, the Kalman length um, underscore M, the millimeter is double and so on. So this is important um, part of read R and we will see more about this later. We also supply an inline, we can also supply an inline CSV and um, this is useful in experimenting with read R and also creating reproducible examples to share with others. So this is how we do if you want to um, create a table object from using the read underscore CSV. So this, the first row here is by default used as the column names and the other, the other value, the other rows that we have here, that the lines are other way we have got the values. These are the column, the rows that will be contained in those columns and we separate the columns using a comma. So like I've said, this is the common convection where we have the data is as the column names. So sometimes we want to skip a few lines of the metadata at the top of the file. So we can either use um, argument skip is equals to n to skip the first n lines or you can comment it using the argument comment is equals to any character that you put that you want to comment. So for this case, we put hash to drop all lines that start with that. So we have, this is the first line of metadata. This is the second line of metadata. But then I want to skip these first two lines. So I'll say skip is equals to two. 
and you see it returns a table object with only the XYZ um, columns. The other option you've said is to put a like a character here. So here I've put um, hash in. This is, I, I want to skip this and I'll use the argument comment is equals to this hash. So it will return, it will print out a table object with one times three columns as expected. Perhaps the data doesn't have column names. So what do we do? We use the column underscore names is equals to false to tell CSV to not treat the first row as the headings. And you've seen that in by default, it does that. So instead, it will label them sequentially from X1 to Xn. So this is the case. And we see here this, uh, we, we have been introduced to something new here. So um, this is backslash, yes, backslash and small n. This we, we are telling R to skip, to add a new line, sorry. So this is the note. We can alternatively use the column is equal, and call, call underscore names um, arguments, which is a character vector used in column names. So we have got, these are the values that we want to contain in our CSV file. And we want our first column to be called X, our second column to be called Y, and our third column to be called Z. Okay, so we have another option that commonly needs tweaking, which is when we have unknown data. So we can use NA to, so instead, as we print it out, we'll have, it will be the unknown value represented with NA. And you can see here that we see NA is equals to um, dots, yeah, enclosed it in um, this <laughs> quotes, sorry, I was looking for that one. So we can, you can either use to, apart from the dots, you can do also a space. I tried that out as well. So what we have learned above, we can apply it in the read underscore TSV, TSV and also those with fixed files, the read underscore FWF. Please note that to read more challenging files, we'll need, more, we'll need to learn more about the read R passes each column, turning them into R vectors. John, would you please explain that? I... Um, so each column in a data frame is a, a vector. Um, and so, okay, like, let's say, um, you know, let's say you had a column or had, had data where, uh, the data has both like commas and semicolons within each column. That would be an example where you have to, you have to know a little bit more uh, in order to read that in because you can't use read CSV, you can't use read CSV2, you would probably have to use read delim and tell it how that file happens to store its data. Sometimes maybe it uses a pipe character or you know whatever and so you have to use the more advanced things in those cases. I'll say like it depends what you're working with but read CSV is going to work a lot of the time. Like a lot of data is in CSV format. Um, so okay. often start there and then if it doesn't work, go from there. Okay, so. thank you. So let's compare the functions, the read underscore CSV with the base function, the read dot CSV. So there are three reasons as to why the read underscore CSV is better. First is that they are quite fast. That is almost 10 times the base, the base equivalents. And um, so this stated that the long running jobs have a progress bar, hence we can see what is happening. And also we can look at speed from the data dot table function, the fread, sorry, data dot table package, the fread function. So it doesn't, okay. Um, 
doesn't fit quite well into the tidy verse, but it can be quite, it can be a bit fast. So the, the other, the second reason is that it produces tables. That is, as we learned, that it doesn't con convert the character vectors to factors, that it doesn't change the data type. It also uses the row names and manipulate column names. It adds a data type below the column name. They are also more reproducible. If we use the base R functions, they do inherit some behaviors from our operating systems and environment variables. So the importing code onto our computer may not work into someone else. The other section is passing a vector. We learn about different pass underscore functions that take the character vector and returns a more specialized vector such as a logical integer or a date. So here, if we look at, we have got true, false, and NA. If we pass um, this function underscore logic, the pass underscore logic, and we look at the structure, we see that it returns, it gives us a logic, and um, it returns the values. Yeah, we can also see the same for the pass underscore integer. So it returns integer, as you see int. Also for the date, it returns dates. So not only are these pass functions useful in their own, but they're also an important building block for it R. So like any other, all of other functions of tidyverse, these pass, pass underscore functions are uniform. That is the first argument is a character vector to pass and the NA, NA argument, it specifies strings which should be treated as missing. In the example here, we want everything to be written as an integer but we have a unknown value, which is represented with the dots when you're entering the data. So as we're printing out, we'll see that we'll have NA. So suppose this passing fails, a warning will then be returned. So in this case, we want to pass integer. However, we have the ABC and we have the a decimal. This is a, so 123.45, the decimal. So we'll see some warning that two files sorry, two passing did fail. And the failures will be printed out so we can print out the failures and see. So it tell us it tells us row three and four. Um, it, okay, we have this, it returns a table of two with of two rows because two, two, two passing did fail in four columns with the following. So it tells us the row, the column, what is ex what was expected and the actual. Okay, so when we when you have many passing failures, it's best to check what, what is the problem using the problems function to get the complete set. This will print out a table that we can manipulate it using a dplyr. Okay, I realize there's so many chats. I haven't. Okay. I think I think you're caught up with with what we've been talking about in the chat. Um. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. For us to use the passes, we need to understand what is available and how to deal with the different inputs. So there are eight important um, passes function that is one for logical and integer, and this will pass logical and integer. So for double is strictly meant for passing numeric, but when we have pass underscore number is a flexible numeric. So it means that here, what I understood is that if a number has like another character or some wording before that number, it will still return it. It will still return it as a, um, an output with only number in discarding in any other thing that is around it. So it's not worth to note that these are more complicated than what we might expect due to the different part of the world how we write numbers. So they um. We'll see in, in the next section. 
that thing is that the function is pass underscore character and this will pass a character so what what this is happening what this is doing is the character encoding and this makes it complicated and like how simple it should be as you expect as we think sorry <laughs> the other thing is um pass underscore factor and this creates factors so factors are data structures that are used to represent categorical variables with fixed and known values so for dates and time we have the following functions the one with underscore date time one with underscore dates and the other one with underscore time we'll see how the following are applied so these are the most complicated because of the different ways we write dates Okay, so for numbers, the three problems that. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Federica was looking for more info about problems. Um, it's it's actually it's really funny because I've used reader a million times, and I'm sure I've used the parse functions at some point, but I like I had forgotten they exist, and uh, problems I totally had like if I've ever seen it, I I didn't remember it, um, and so. It, it, I love that about this book. That's something that I, I'm like, oh, I can just skim this chapter. I, I know all this stuff. And then I start looking at it. I'm like, oh, oh, I actually don't think I actually knew that. Um, and pro like problems is great. I'll, I, I would guess that that would still be available if you used Reader, since Reader is using the parse functions under, the, I mean, if you used Read CSV, it's using the parse functions under the hood. And so you could probably run problems on something that you read in using read CSV. And I, you know, it generates this tibble that tells you row by row, this was screwed up because of, you know, because of this thing. Um, we expected an integer and we actually got, it actually had ABC. So it comes in as NA. Um, but I think that's, it's a nice one to know about and to pay attention, like to, to remember <laughs> that it exists because sometimes it is, you know, you'll, you'll try to read something in and you'll get an error and you're like, oh, okay, somewhere in my 10,000 rows, there was something that was weird and you're trying to figure out exactly what it was and problems just tells you it, it was here. It, this is what I saw. This is what I did to it. Um, and it's not what I was expecting. And the reason that this is super important is that things like read CSV are guessing which parse functions to use. And sometimes they guess wrong. Like sometimes the first 10 rows of your data are integers or however many it uses, 100 rows, I'm not sure. And so it's like, oh, it, this must be an integer column. But then it gets past that and there's decimal points. And so you would have all these numbers that don't get parsed properly and problems will tell you, these are the ones that didn't parse properly and here's what I saw and what I got. And then that can help you debug things. Um, it's thousand rows, okay. But yeah, you know, if you have a 10,000 row um, file and the first thousand is all integers, just happens to be, and then number 1001 is uh, 1.2, it'll parse that as NA because it's like, well, that's not an integer. I don't know what to do. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, at the moment, we look. We'll now study the numbers. So, for numbers, we'll expect three different problems. And the first problem is because of how numbers are written in different parts of the world. Like you've said, that some countries will use decimal in in between the integer and a fraction, but as others use a comma. Also, numbers are often surrounded by other characters that provide some context such as currency, as we have dollar a hundred and also percentage. The third thing is that numbers are frequently contained in grouping characters to make them easy to read. So we have like, this is a million and the grouping character varies differently. So to address the first problem where the numbers are different, they're written in dif differently in other parts of the world, we'll use the argument local 
to that is an object that specifies the passing op options which differs from place to place so here the most this is the most important option is the character that is used as a decimal mark when passing numbers and also we can override the default value of the dots by creating a new local i hope i'm pronounce it correctly <laughs> setting the decimal mark arguments. This is very interesting. Very interesting. Just because uh, this has happened recently to me, to find a CSV with um, a colon of numbers, like sort of uh, number of uh, percentage of deaths and everything. So they were uh, divided by age classes. And there were some with dots, and some with commas so you actually <laughs> um there was some a bit of confusion when you uh made the formula this is was this was in excel so you when you actually made a formula you, you find out that you have some a certain number of uh now values and then when you go and checking the the column for understanding the reason you find that you have two different um like codification of numbers so they're not decimals they're not millions so what are they so maybe with problems i can see this can i or oh, using this function within one column that's still going to be hard like if you're going back and forth between period and comma because you would be telling it that this one uses periods or this one uses commas and if it if it's both then you gotta you know you'll have more work to do i think you're trying to say something ryan you're muted <laughs> no sorry about that no i was just i was thinking in the top of my head listening to frederica or, or talking about the uh, mixed mixed values or mixed uh, uh syntax within one column you would need another stage of wrangling that would separate those two right you would want to take association to okay this is going to be using commas uh this is going to be using periods and then between the two of them uh yeah that would be a a, a really funny mix logic the the reason that i think this could be a possibility um so let's say that we've got a a, a multi-user uh all using similar software or or maybe it's the the same uh uh developer or, or uh, uh, contract of software, and then they have different versions. And maybe within those different versions, uh, there's a change in the way it's it's saving that file and or saving that, uh, uh, that uh, value, one using periods, one using commas. Mm -hmm. and, and it's 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 ingesting into the same, uh, I don't know, server, I guess, or, or where you're reading it from. That's just a thought yeah. that I could have of where this mix would come in. A lot of times what I would do there is read that column in as character and then hopefully there's something else that can tell you whether you expect it to be period or comma, like maybe the country that the person is in or something like that. And then basically do a, do a data transformation after you have it read in using the other column or maybe, um, you know, like maybe you could just convert all commas to periods or all periods to commas and then parse it. But if it's got both in any one number, like if it has, you know, uh, 1000.2 like that, um, converting all commas to periods wouldn't work because then you would have 1.000.2 and that's no good. Right. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a hard problem. <laughs> and, and, right now, I was yeah. I was thinking maybe with uh, this um, this function you can just uh, like when you load the file and then try to to see if there's any problems in the files of, well, of this kind. Of right. Yeah. I mean, if nothing else, the problem uh, function will tell you where it ran into weirdness, and then and knowing that can often be enough to fix it, especially if it's a small you know. Sometimes like this, like I'll try to come up with some program programmatic way to do it, and then there are five that are broken. So just just go edit those five in the file, and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's one thing to watch out for: is is it 
thousands that are weird or is it just a handful if it's just a handful just fix it <laughs> you know yeah. yeah anyway okay <laughs> so we have an example here of 1.23 so we'll use the pass uh, underscore double and it will return a numeric value so if I want to change, this dot is the default. So if I want to change it, I'll use the local arguments and the local function. I'll say that I want the decimal underscore mark to be a semi, uh, sorry, a comma instead of a dot. And it will return a numeric value as well. So what to know that read R default local is US centric because the R is also US centric. That means that the documentation of base R is written in American English. An alternative approach would be to try and guess the defaults from your operating system. This might be hard to do well and it makes the code fragile. The pass underscore number, we have said that this addresses the second problem that what if um, a number is accompanied by another character? So what it does is that it will ignore the numeric character before and after the number. This is very useful, again, in currencies and percentages, but also works to ex extract numbers embedded in a text. So we can see this example, it will turn an, um, a numeric value in ignoring any other character. We have the last problem with the different separator. So here we'll also use the pass number because we've said that it is flexible and we can use, we can add the local function to ignore the grouping mark for the defaults. So for defaults, I, so I am not really sure what is the default case for this, but you can see here it returns numbers without the, oh, so I think the default is comma, yeah. So if we look at, what is used in the other parts of Europe, this is for America, which is, we've said, sorry, we've said that it is, is used US centric. So we expect that the default will be the comma, which is used in America. So for the other parts of the world, for example, where we have a dot that is used as a separator, we can change it using the group underscore mark and you put whatever that you want. So this is a scene. And also we see that this has, um, the quotes and you can see it will return also numbers. So strings. Thanks, this is very useful. We use the, the this, this thing, the, the, the quote and the, the dots are for decimals in Italy, in Europe, in Germany. So this is like, a, Sorry about my dog. Yeah, it um, it's nice that it it's you know it defaults. It has it has a default, um, but it's always the same default no matter where you are. So that you are you know it's not going to work differently if you're using code in a different place. And then past that, you overwrite it to be what you want it to be. So yeah. definitely useful. Um, yeah, that's uh, super interesting. Um, so in Peru, at least, maybe not currently, but when I grew up here, um, millions were split by the quote, and then the rest of the separators were commas, all within the same number. So it's it's just interesting to think about, you know, how all of these things are split and how it can cause problems when you're trying to read data in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, and, yeah. And uh, now we also have this, uh, the, the dots as a million and the, sorry, the commas as a million and the dots stay with decimals. So we may have both of these things, some, most of the times like this and sometimes this. Uh, the old version was this with the quote. So, Sometimes it's tricky because if you open it with, uh, for example, Excel, it grabs you the, the things from your uh, version 
uh, of Excel. So if you are in Europe, if you are in Euro in America, whatever, you you open the file and it transforms it in, uh, automatically. So I don't understand why I found, for example, a mixture of dotted commas in. Uh, so that that is like. I don't know how that happened, could have happened, but uh, so maybe this is an issue that very, very uh, tricky sometimes. Okay, thank you for the contribution and to know that. <laughs> In Africa, we use comma. Oh, sorry, particularly Kenya. <laughs> I don't know of other countries. <laughs> Let me clarify that. So we have for strings, like I've said, we have different ways of representing the same string. Hence, we will use the pass underscore character. And this doesn't mean that it is as simple as we see. So we, we have to understand what is happening in um, how computers, sorry, represent strings. So we'll use the function um, this the car to row to see the underlying interpretation of strings. So the example is of for Hadley, and we see that it returns 48, 61, and so on. So let's understand the numbers. It's that these hexadecimal numbers represent a byte of information. So 48 would represent H, um, 61 will represent A, and we have got this C, sorry, 6C will represent L. So this is known as encoding. That is the mapping from the hexadecimal number to a character. And um, how R use is known as the American standard code for information interchange. For other languages, it gets more complicated. Like I've said, this is the standard one, which is supported everywhere and is as this, the UTF-8. Okay, so this can encode just every other character that is used by humans today and any other extra symbols such as emoji. So read R will use the this, the encoding thing um, yeah this one <laughs> ev uh, everywhere so it will assume that our data is utf encode uh, and hyphen eight encoded when we write and read it so this is a good default but it will fail for data that have been produced by older systems that don't understand this encoding um uh, if you do so, it will print out strings that look weird. And at times, these characters are messed up. And other times, we will get complete gibberish. So for example, if we have this, it will return... Um, so it will, re it will return this, the statement. If you have x2, it returns this. So we may not understand this. But if we want to fix the problem, we, we need to specify the encoding using the local. So we have seen that we have seen, we have learned about three functions that we can do to alter the defaults using the local function. So here in case number one, we have, we have El Nino. So this is Latin one. The encoding used was Latin one, and it will print out what we see here. If we have, if we do the second, if we do the second vec, uh, vector that has been entered, this bunch of character, sorry, that has been entered with this bunch of different letters here, the encoding is shift hyphen G, sorry, J I S. And we see that, oh, um, it shouldn't return this. It read, uh, in R, it returns something else. Yeah, that's, it's funny that you got an encoding problem. Like that's exactly demonstrating that encoding is painful. Whenever you have text and you have weird symbols showing up, it's an encoding problem. And it can happen if you copy paste into like something that makes it think that your encoding is something than what it was when you 
um, started, it, it's, it is a very painful problem to deal with. Um, thankfully, okay. more and more things are defaulting everything into UTF-8, and then you don't have to worry about it. But um, it is something I've had to deal with uh, quite a lot. Um, we have a lot of uh, database fields that are set to Latin 1. And so it's not the same as UTF-8, and sometimes some character will come through broken, um, and you have to deal with that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so how do we correct, uh, how do we find the correct encoding? So first is that if the book said, if you're lucky, <laughs> it can be included in the data documentation. If you're not, read R, read R sorry, will provide, um, will help us figure out what is the encoding, the correct encoding, and we use the function guess underscore encoding. This, please note, this is not a full proof, but it works better upon having lots of text. However, it is a reasonable place to start. Okay, so we have, we have our first, the first character of X1, we see that if you use the function guess underscore encoding, it will turn a table with two rows and two, fun two, two columns with encoding and confidence. What does that mean? For X1, the El Nino statement was particularly bad for this year. If we do the S the guess underscore encoding, we want to check what encoding type that has been used. It returns these two columns, but I never understood what they mean. Would anyone help me? Uh, so those are other encoding options, the ISO 8859-1 um, and dash nine. And it's saying, how, how sure is it that that is what the encoding is? Um, and it's not very sure. The more text you feed it, the more, the better it's going to do, probably. So if, you know, the short string, it's not going to be so sure. A long string, it'll be more sure. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's still just guessing. So it it's so much better if you can find out what it is. Like if you have information from the source of how what is the encoding. It's so annoying that this is, a thing because UTF-8 solves it. If everyone would just use UTF-8, it would all be fine, but nope. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> and sorry, I didn't really answer that. Um, no, you have, like, I think I understand. Oh, sorry, there's another question. Oh yeah, Um. so on top of what John said, so it gets encoded um, because he made mention like, as more you put more data and it may predict accurately, so I'm not uh, on top of um at the uh, back of the hood. Is it like a kind of um, a machine learning classifier that's trying to do the prediction or what? Um, this encoding, guess encoding. And does anybody have the idea? Sorry, I'm taking a look at the code to see. Um, it's not machine learning. It's, it's much simpler than that. It's basically, um, it's, it, it's basically, it changes the encoding to different things and sees how much it changes and okay. then uses that to, to give a confidence on, oh, it's probably this. Okay. Um, but it, it's much you know, it's it's much more of an if else kind of yeah. thing rather than yeah. machine learning. So it's the rule day. Yes. Or uh, right. heuristic okay. as the uh, the word the word of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Heuristic. <laughs> yeah. Heuristic. <laughs> and I I want to say that um, he he mentioned heuristics um, once or twice in this chapter, and it's one of those words that. I never encountered it, I don't think, before going into data science. And then it became oh, really? a word that people use all the time. Yeah. Like I and so heuristic just means a set of rules. And people will throw it around and like, oh, I use a heuristic to figure this out. It means, you know, I use an if else set of rules or some sort of tree. It 
it's rather than like a statistic, statistical process. Yeah. Um, like machine learning. So heuristic. Mm -hmm. um, it's a word that once people know it, I think they really like to use it. It's a, it's a fun word. But. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I like to use it also. Like, like <laughs> if I, we use heuristic rules to, you know, <laughs> yep. yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, let's see if this pace, let's see how Zoom deals with uh, encoding that in theory, that is what uh, Lucy was trying to show us with the shift GAIS. Um, that it's, uh, I don't, it looks like it's, um, not sure what, what language those characters are, but it's showing these special characters rather than the symbols that it um, originally printed as. So when you tell it the encoding. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So the first, all right, the first argument. Lucy, one second. Can I just interrupt on sort of a tangent? So what's the difference then between an algorithm and a heuristic if an algorithm is also a set of rules? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just confused. <laughs> I think, so I think an algorithm is the wider term that okay. an algorithm can use statistical methods and it can have things that are more fuzzy, whereas a heuristic is uh, just a set of rules. Like it, you're not doing any sort of... Um, statistical. Yeah. You're, I think, I, I don't, it's funny. I don't, <laughs> I still don't really know that well. Let's see if I can get... Um, okay. <laughs> oh it's awful i'm frantically google searching at the moment yeah because um several of the merriam-webster definitions of heuristic have the word heuristic in them so <laughs> that's not good yeah trial and error methods huh okay so yeah, I think it is it's it's more of a straight up like if else kind of thing. It tries this thing, and if that doesn't work, it tries the next thing. If that doesn't work, it tries the next thing. Is more okay. what a heuristic okay. is. Yeah. Um versus so that is a type of algorithm versus algorithm can be any set of rules. Yeah. So okay. Yeah, okay. algorithm can be like a kind of well-defined set of instructions that you need to follow this to achieve this. But I think heuristic. You just try this and that and try to find a, a common way to achieve a particular stuff that uh, may not necessarily uh, be um, um, an algorithm with well-defined instructions and stuff and like that. I'll say that okay. heuristics tend to be a lot more like brute force. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that might be part of why the word is popular because it makes it sound like you did something nice and fancy and cool but really it's well i tried this and that didn't work so i tried this other thing that didn't work so i tried this other thing and it worked so i tried a heuristic <laughs> i see okay okay thank you yep. that helps <laughs> i was gonna say there was i, I just found a, a really awesome quote that uh that i'd like to share but um I, it, this is off of google and and it's some uh is it cura the uh, the yeah. the place where everybody has their opinions of, of what should or shouldn't be. Anyway, I do like this quote. It says, "An algorithm has a solution. An algorithm is math, so you you can prove your solution. You know if it's right or wrong. In a heuristic, it's more of guesswork. Just as John had mentioned, it said the key point about a heuristic is that there's no way of knowing when the solution you get is wrong. There's no way to prove it. Right? There's no solution to it. You're just guessing. You're you're assuming that it's correct." Um, Maybe that John, I'm I'm reinforcing your comments, sir. I think you had the good uh, good. Yeah, um, it is funny. Like it is one of those things. Like, now I'm going to go down this whole path because apparently it has a formal meaning in computer science, and that's part of why it comes in. I'm sure, but people don't use necessarily the computer science definition when they're talking about a heuristic. So, um, but yeah, that it's. It's a set of rules that, you know, eh, it'll probably work. <laughs> and that's part of it is I used this, I used a heuristic. So I, you know, I, I'm 
pretty confident that I chose the right character encoding. But really, you're just using something that hopefully we'll find the answer. And the same with um, what we were talking about with the columns in read CSV, that it uses a heuristic where it looks at the first thousand and it says, oh, looks like these are uh, integers. But it's not necessarily right because the thousand and first one might have been a non-integer. And if the heuristic were slightly different, it would have a, total, a different guess for what the columns were. Um, <laughs> so could you say one is more trial and error without a like a method behind it, whereas the other one would be a set of instructions for problem solving that provides an answer or something like that? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think that's so uh, sorry, I was reading that um, one of the things that they point out in the def the computer science definition mm -hmm. is that it's for solving it quickly when something you know something more formal would be too slow so like you could set something an algorithm up that would find the absolute correct answer for like uh the first thousand thing like in a million row data set the true way to find the answer would be to look at all million rows and see right. what works but eh Good enough. Uh, let's look at the first thousand. That'll work. Um, and so heuristic does have a little bit of a kind of hand wavy uh, piece to it that you're doing something okay. that should okay. be good enough. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's okay. It's a word, that, and I, I really do think that part of why it gets used yeah. so much is it makes it sound formal when it really is. I just did. Eh, I used a heuristic. <laughs> <laughs> good enough. So. Okay, okay, I think I get it. Thank you. Okay, so let's proceed. We, the first argument of the guess coding and coding is the path to the file, or it could be a row vector. And um, this is useful if strings are already in R. So we have been suggested, uh, sorry, there's a suggested read here. If you get the slides, have a look at it. It's worth your read. So the other thing is factors, how, so we, we have learned that R uses factors to represent categorical variables that have a known set of possible values. So when we give a pass, a, a, a pass, fact, sorry, pass underscore factum function, a vector that is known, that a vector that, that has got known le levels to generate, it will generate a warning whenever an expected value is present. So let's see this, we have a vector with fruits, with apple and banana, but now whatever we are passing here, so we pass, these are the, these are the known levels. However, we have got, this is banana now, yeah. Um, and we specify the, the, the levels with the argument levels, the fruits. So we, we see that it will show us one passing failure and it tells us the expected is zero, the third, the third, which is this banana. Na, and um, this value is not in whatever we had, whatever is in the fruit vector. So we see um, a table that tells, uh, that gives us more information. So I tried passing the species column of the penguins data sets and it returned of it returned such a table. We have been to as John had suggested, if we experience from pro pro problematic sorry entries, it is of, often best to leave the vectors as characters. You know, we, work, we work from there. So the other thing is about dates, the dates hyphen times and times. So we pick three passes depending on what we have. So we have a date that is the number of days since uh, 1970, January 1st, when we, we want a date and time. So this is, we're looking at the number of seconds since mid -time, midnight, 1970, January 1st. And um, thirdly is time. 
that is the number of seconds since midnight. So these are the functions we do use. So when we use the pass underscore date time without any other additional argument, it tells us the type of encoding that is done. This is the ISO 8601 date time. And this is the international standard in which the components of bits have been organized from the biggest to the smallest. Uh, that is what I understood. So it will be, we have year, uh, month, day, hour, minute, and second. So in this example, we have, if, if we, we do pass underscore date time, it will return the, it will return the year. So it will return the date and also the time and the time zone. But if we omit time, it will be set to midnight. As we've said, that if we don't have, we are not including, we don't include time, it will only show us um, the default, which is midnight. Okay, so the most, this is the most important standard date time. If we work with date, if you work with dates and time frequently, there's a suggested read. Have a look at it, which is basically the Wikipedia page of the encoding of the dates. Another function now is the pass underscore dates, and here it expects a four-digit year that is separated by either a hyphen or um, this is forward slash, and then the month that also separates between the month and the day. We have got either hyphen or a forward slash. If we look at this example where we have got, to, we have 2010 hyphen 10 01, it will return such time. We have another pass function that is the pass underscore time. This will expect the inputs here to be hour, which is separated by a colon, minutes, uh, which is optionally um, also separated by a colon between the minutes and the seconds. And we can also um, include AM and the PM specifier. So for this, we will use the package HMS and the function pass time, sorry, pass underscore time, it will return the, it will return the time. The same as that. So base R do lack the grid built in, the grid built in class for time data. So we have, that is why we have, we have read about the HMS. If this default don't work with your data, you can supply your own date and time and build it up in the following pieces. So these are um, how you do it for the year, for the month as well. And this also for the dates. I, I haven't learned this by heart, so I can't really mention all of them, but once you have the slides, please have a look at them. So one thing that has been, we have, we have been told to be aware of the abbreviations because the EST is the Canadian time zone, which is different, um, meaning that it doesn't have the daylight savings time and it is not the East, Eastern standard time. Um, if we have got nine digits, this is how you write. So what do we do in order to figure out the best correct formats? The best it is to create fewer examples in character vector and tests with one of the passing functions. So we have, for example, we have got zero one um, this. So we see that this will return. We have month forward slash uh, day and then forward slash year. So it will return. So we have said that it starts from the highest to return the year, the month, and the dates. We can see some differences in this case. And um, another example is here, where we have, we want percentage year, um, month and dates. So we see that it returns the year. This is the month and this is the dates. These, the percentage small b and percentage uh, capital B with the non-English month names. For this, we we'll need to set a lang argument to the local function. For you to know what the, 
the different dates. Please check out this function, the dates, underscore names, underscore langs. And if you see, if, if your language isn't included, we, you can create your own using the date underscore name, sorry, the date underscore names. I tried, I, I, I did run this in R. I was looking for our national, oh, sorry, our, our local language and I couldn't find it. Well, I, I wasn't really sure Kiswahili is K-I or S-W because it writes it as that. Yeah, it's there. Uh, you can try with the S-W, I think. S-W, okay. Yeah, and another way to find all the languages available, you can just run date underscore names underscore lines without any arguments. It will list all the languages available. Now, I'll write something down. Okay, thank you. Uh, Okay, so we have, and we have said that we can create our own. Mm -hmm. This is for French. I cannot pronounce this, but it's 1st January um, 2015. And like you've said, with capital B, percentage capital B, it will return these dates. So the other section is, uh, John, should you proceed? We have got two more, and now the exercises. Is Sorry, I was stuck. I was stuck on mute. Um, yeah, I, let's go ahead and pause here, and we'll just pick this up next week for the second half of this chapter. Um, this has been great. I, I really like how deep we've gotten into it. And, you know, like I was saying before we started, this is something that. Um, it, it's almost like I understand the philosophy of the book, but you need data to do anything. And so it's really nice to really get into how do you read in data. Um, and so taking our time to go through it, I think is good. Um, so yeah, let's just go go ahead and pick up at 11.4 next week. Sounds good. John, um, I can volunteer for chapter 12 then. Okay, so you have two weeks to prep it. Yes, perfect. <laughs> All right, excellent. All right, yeah, and um, I hope you're available next week, Lucy, to continue. If not, <laughs> let me know, and uh, we can go from there. Yes, I am. All right. Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lucy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you as well. <laughs> Bye. Bye.